Welcome to Gridley, California. Today we're with John Justison and Joe Harp. And we're looking at some walnut trees on some traditionally tough ground, high magnesium. Can you tell us a little bit about this, John? The ground is higher in clay content and therefore higher in magnesium and tighter soil. We're trying to figure out ways to open it up to get better water penetration, better drainage, and just make a healthier soil. What, what have you tried that, you, that seems to be working? Any, anything that uh, is, is gaining ground on this we've, ground? We've been using GSR Calcium. Um, last year was my first year using it, and we kind of stepped in slow, went a pound of the acre on it. And since then, I've started adding 90 grams a month, and it seems to be opening up the soil and making it looser. Do you, are you, have you seen enough that it's got your attention that you'd like to do more? Yes. We're going to try two pounds this winter. And That's what I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Get this stuff ginning. So what kind of effect does the healthy soil have with like a pest management? Does it have any effect? Yeah. Lesson? Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Have you ever heard of people squeezing the leaf or the petiole for, for juice, checking the bricks or the sugar? Yeah. Plant feeding insects above or below the ground. Pick your critter up on top, pick your critter down below, armyworm, wireworm, rootworm, cutworm, detrimental nematode. All of these plant feeding insects are born and live without a pancreas. What that means is they can't digest high sugar content fiber. That sugar will ferment, turn to alcohol, and kill them. 13, 14% sugar, sucrose, photosynthesis driven sugar, is the sugar content that plant feeding insects can't handle. It will, they will die. We can't get sugar, and when I say sugar, and I'm not a chemist, they, some people say, oh, listen to this caveman chemistry. This is much <laughs> but sugar is made up of carbon, oxygen and hydrogen. If you remember high school or college, uh, C6, H1206 is the chemical formulator for sugar. Well, carbon and oxygen is what makes up the majority of this plant. So if the plant has calcium and phosphorus available to it in the soil that microbes have chewed up to become humus, it's little miniature casseroles throughout the whole soil so every root can grab it. When it has that calcium and phosphorus, it now ups its ability to grab sunlight and to make more sugar to push down to feed more microbes. And now we've got a bigger system running. And so the plant will always have a little more sugar in the roots than in the tops. The reason being, You'll have one, if you were ever to dig a root up and squeeze the, the sap out of it, it'll be one to maybe 2% or two bricks higher below the ground than what you see above. Reason that is, if a storm comes and levels stuff or beats the plant up, there's a little reserve. It's got some down there to get going again. So what happens a lot of times as we start to heal an orchard and, and start to heal the soil, the roots will actually take off first to provide the growth for the tops. Gotcha. And that isn't just trees, that isn't just bushes, that's every plant. So the, the plant, like, so this tree, when you look at it, if you look at the drip line or the outside where the water would shed, that's normally about what your roots better be minimum. The goal is we want these roots to go to the middle. Yeah. And and here's the cool thing is what was the hardest area and what normally is the hardest area in the middle of your floor is now starting to loosen up quicker because you've got plant growth here. Yeah. What that's going to do, that's going to encourage this tree that's got a little trouble here. Yes. It's not quite as healthy as the rest but it's gonna encourage this tree to push roots out past its drip line. And all of a sudden now it's, it's, it's got access to more 
more groceries. Yeah. And the <clears throat> drip line on this tree would be bigger, but we prune it annually mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. promote growth and get it established the way we want. So with that then, say you got your soil healthy, but then it comes time to replace the block. Is there a need for fumigation with healthy soil for nematodes? No. Okay. A fumigation is designed to kill everything. everything. Good yeah. and bad. Methyl bromide, that isn't even used anymore, is it? Uh, no, they it's quit the, using uh, it. Tell tell tel you. Tel yeah. Yeah, they had to switch away from methyl bromide, and uh, now they're using tellium, but get your checkbook out if you're going to uh, yeah, use it. It's over 2000 bucks an acre or something. Yes. Did your parents do anything like this, or are you doing anything like this for your child? Are you teaching your child to spit, swear, steal, and be, be crooked? Not on purpose, no. <laughs> <laughs> but... And your parents didn't teach us how to spit, leal, spit, cheat, lie, steal, but we all figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Despite the environment that parents try to create, there are still bad things right. come in. Right, right, right. Here's where we're at is there is a battle above and below ground in people and in microbes and in diseases and viruses and bacteria on every level of life. There's a fight between good versus evil. When you create a bad environment, you will grow bad things. Bad things being the chemicals, the kilocides, the high salts, the high sodiums, all the things that aren't natural. Everything we do with, our, with soil works is we are trying to create as perfect an environment for the microbes. Because despite the soil being 45% minerals, those minerals just create the environment or the housing for the microbes to grow the tree. Because if we were to take any part of this tree, it'd probably be during the growing season, it'll be 70, 80% water. We take the water, dehydrate it. So if we, if we took, oh, if we took this big banana leaf, <laughs> now that's a solar collector. If, if this tree was completely full of these, we wouldn't see that little yellow spot. This is a huge solar collector that's just d doing its job. But if we were to dehydrate this, take all the water out and do an analysis on it, this tree wants this leaf to be 47% carbon, the dry matter. This leaf wants to be 43% oxygen. Okay, carbon and oxygen, 47, 43, we're at 90%. Most guys don't buy a lot of carbon or oxygen every year. Carbon and oxygen comes from carbon dioxide from the microbes. Carbon and oxygen come from photosynthesis, the, pro, the, the manufacturing of sugar. So 47% carbon, 43% oxygen, we're at 90%. We're just getting going. Yeah. 4% hydrogen, another component of water, H2O. Hydrogen, also another component of sugar. This plant, this tree, and all plants only want to be made up 3% of nitrogen. And then all the time we spend on soil tests and all the minerals trying to get that right, only 3% of this leaf wants to be mineral. So if you get your soil test perfect like a lot of agronomists want you to do you've got a three percent chance of being successful if you work on carbon and oxygen 90 percent even on a ho horrible curve that's still an a yeah. <laughs> as your soil becomes a a a good host to microbes they're giving off co2 every day just like we are that is what grows the tree that is what grows the plant. That is what fills your checkbook in a good way at the end of the year because it's nothing more than photosynthesis and microbes that make up these plants. But we have to have the soil minerals all in line and calcium has to be available on every level to discipline the spoiled rotten little brat child magnesium 
yeah. from from tying up nitrogen, from from knocking the air out of it, and just being a pain in the backside. So everything we do is making sure the microbes are happy. Because if the microbes are happy, the, the plants are going to be happy. If they're happy, yeah. But if you can improve your soil and make it a happier spot, the tree's going to respond faster. And a lot of the things we've done so far is kind of just trying to band aid other issues. We're not really solving any problems. We're just attacking symptoms instead of going after the root of the cause, which is the soil. The thing with our calcium, and to give you an idea, our calcium, we start with calcium carbonate limestone. We buy the highest grade food grade on the market. When we bring it in, the calcium gets separated from, much, from as much carbonate as we can. To give you an idea, out of 44,000 pound load of calcium carbonate, we usually end up with about 3,800 pounds of usable. So we don't get 10% out of, out of what we start with. Calcium and a lot of other things are kind of like getting married. You, pick the, you find the gal you love, it's like she's the one. And most of us, me more specifically, doesn't take a look at the rest of the family. <laughs> in-laws, outlaws, it can be good, it can be bad, but it's a package deal. Calcium in the past has been that. It's like, well, I need calcium, but I got all this carbonates, or I got sulfates, or I got nitrates, or I got whatever. Yeah. We simplified that and tried to get as close to bare naked calcium as we can. So basically, we've taken mama, calcium, we've divorced her, we've stripped her down, we've cleaned her up, and all of a sudden now she's not satisfied because she was used to hanging on to a lot of carbonates. And so now she's, she's divorced and she's a little wild-eyed, a little crazy. It's, it, this calcium is tough to work with during the processing. It wants to grab onto everything. So we tame it down a little bit. When it's mixed with water, that's our first activation. When it gets sprayed on the field, that's a second activation. It's now looking for salt. It's looking for sodium. It's looking for magnesium. It wants to grab onto stuff. And it will grab onto stuff as long as it has electrical charge available to pull it. So when the water carries it down, it'll grab as much unwanted stuff and bring it in and make that soil structure better. Yeah. And then the sugar just goes in there as a carrier to help make it go in a little better? No, the sugar is just, the sugar is a quick, it's a candy bar for the microbes in the soil. Because there's a lot of stuff in the soil that hasn't been digested yet. And it's going to take some work to digest it. Sugar that we put in there, a pound, it's just a quick fix, just like when you're harvesting or your or spring work and you're running hard, you grab a can of pop and you grab a snicker bar or something. It's not really the best thing you should eat, but it'll get you by. Yeah. And it'll get these bugs started to, to doing their job, give them a quick rush of energy and get them going. That, so no, it, yeah. it's just a food source for the microbes. Gotcha. So... We are the weird ducks of agriculture because we do almost everything different than conventional agriculture because conventional agriculture wants you to sell you a lot of stuff. And that's kind of what got John's interest is we were so different. It's like, I'm tired of the same old, same old. If, I'm tired of buying the nitrogen. Yeah, if you do the same thing over and over and expect different results, that's... Uh... Definition of insanity, I believe. <laughs> we've been doing this for, in the rice have been grown here for 100 years, and we've been doing the same thing for the last 100 years. I mean, yeah. sure, there's been advancements in seed and, and different fertilizers and stuff like that, but in order to see a change, I wanted to do something different. I mean. Welcome home, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and, and, and the thing is, talking with Andrew Petrini, uh, we, we got him on, on film yesterday, but talking with Andrew, I says, what do you think of this whole program? And you know Andrew, he's like, if I hadn't had a, a mentor or a guide, Frank, yeah, he goes, I, w I, I would have thought you were bananas. I mean, that, that's, that was his exact term. I would have thought you were bananas. And that's when you first came, talked to me, it was 
almost mind-blowing listening to all this stuff because we never think about it. We always think of it as nitrogen NPK is what we've been taught in college and school and everything. And this is completely different. And at first I was just, I can't hardly believe this. This, How come we've never heard of this before? How come we don't know about this? And that kind of stuff. And so it was pretty eye-opening for me to think of it as in a different route. Yeah. Well, and there's a neighbor over on... on um east of where Andrew's at. He missed the farm tour, but he called Frank and he says, oh, I missed it. I just heard about this. Can you give me a, can you, can you show me what you're doing at a certain time? And of course, Frank is a gentleman. He's like, well, sure. Well, so this, this Chris has been uh, looking at different things and he just, he, we were there yesterday and he goes, I'm really tired of my PCA. He says, because we've, we've got a block here of almonds he says, they're doing horrible, and it's a little bit worse every year. Our inputs keep going up, our yields keep going down, and all this PCA keeps saying it's NPK, NPK, NPK. And he was, he's so on the same mindset as you. It's like, frustrating. We, yeah, we've been doing the same thing, and it's going the wrong way. I need to do something different. Well, when you say different... We're, we're in the dictionary under different. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, so he put down a pound through his uh, emitters uh, three weeks ago, watered it in a little bit, and he put down another pound, I think, four or five days ago. And so when we first went in with a penetrometer at 200, we couldn't get past the tip. Wow. Now, he was watering yesterday and it's like now this ground will be softer because we won't get them <laughs> i can put those guys in the truck too no no a dog barking is that's real <laughs> yeah. you know this isn't a stage <laughs> yeah 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 the... look at me do i look like pomp and circumstance <laughs> yes but when we when we first went in, there were, we we could we couldn't get the tip in the ground at 200 psi. Well, he was watering. I said, now just the fact that this is wet, it'll be softer. But think about it: a plant is as a major portion of hydrogen and oxygen, water H2O. And he goes, yeah. He says, but he says we'll water, it. and he says it really doesn't get that softer. Well, so I hand it to him, and it's like, go in the dry and just slowly start working your way into where the sprinkler's covering. Well, where it was dry, it was about an inch. He gets a little bit into the water, inch and a half, two inches. Gets a little further closer to the sprinkler. Well, pretty soon, most of where his sprinkler pattern is, is over six inches deep. And he's looking at it, he's like, it's never been like this before. I said, oh, sure it has. No, he says, this is softer than what it's ever been. He goes, I've never had one of these, but he says, something's changed. I said, ah, coincidence. He's like, I don't think so. Well, we're going back and forth, and finally he realizes that I'm messing with him, <laughs> that he's selling me, no, it's a calcium. I'm like, no, I don't think so. He's like, oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> yes, yes. But looking at his leaves they were scrubby and I asked him I said how do you like the leaf size he goes I hate it he said those small leaves are just horrible and that's where I mean this is a bottom leaf that doesn't get as much sunshine I mean that's a between this leaf I mean look at these yeah I always like to see them longer than my hand yeah so so now you okay so now you look at these these leaves are almost the epitome of perfect health. Now you see this, this yellowed branch here? Yeah. This is a green leaf, a green set of leaves on a damaged area. You see how this leaf is curling and twisting? Something's not right. Because this, this should be open, it should be flat. These. These, if they were completely flat, would be perfect. But the closer they are to staying flat as they grow, 
everything is as it wants it to be. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you look at the distance between these leaves, there's a different root system. This root that put these leaves out is into some good stuff. Yeah, considerably more happy. Wherever it may be versus this. Yeah. You know, okay, proportionally, what's the difference here? What would you say? Twice as big. Over twice as big. Yeah. So, but as you look at it, you, you're getting more leaves that are bigger. Yeah. yeah. And if you look into the foliage on here, it's thicker throughout the tree. Last year, I had big leaves, but not as many of them. There just seems to be more leaves this year than there was last year. Was it a better growing season this year? No, it rained considerably this spring. And uh, right when these things were trying to wake up and get going, it was, they were having trouble because they were, it was raining every two weeks out here. So weather-wise, it wasn't perfect? No, never is. If I could control that, we wouldn't be farming. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Farming USA. Yes. So the weather wasn't perfect. What did you do different than, than normal? Did you? This year we started adding in the molasses. We did 90 grams of calcium a month. And we were, we, I put soft rock in here as well and sugar. Okay. I started doing that once a month. And, uh, did this get any big dose of calcium last fall? I did on the south half, I put a pound down on the berms okay. last fall, but not on this half. Okay, okay. We, we went after the trouble areas in my fields, typically are the southern half, and so I did it all on the southern half just to try it out last year. Okay. Are you seeing enough that you're encouraged to go more? Yes, we're gonna do some more this year. I'm gonna, I wanna do two pounds across the whole orchard. And uh, I don't know if I'm gonna go the whole orchard or just concentrate it here on the berms, probably just here on the berms this year. And I may try some cover crops, but I'm a little leery. I'm gonna take it easy on these trees because I've gotta keep the floor nice in order to harvest it in the fall. So I'm gonna try just a couple rows of cover crops here, but on the younger trees where I don't have to worry about the floor, I wanna put more cover crops on and try to open it up. And I was gonna try to inject our brew as well at two different elevations at two feet deep one foot and then put some on top and then put the cover crop in over that and see how it goes okay i want to go to the knuckles but i haven't been able to yet so we're gonna yeah. try to expedite that yeah yeah you mentioned something about you're seeing more dandelions yes where the trees are concentrating it's kind of changed the weeds that are growing where the sprinklers make their circle we're noticing finer like here you can see the finer grasses starting to grow and it's changing the weed spectrum good, it, for the good or bad i i believe the good uh finer grasses are supposed to mean better soil correct well and yeah that's one thing joe when, when you look at grass when you have a fine leaf and a fine sheath the finer the sheath and leaf, the higher the nutrition is. If you look at crabgrass, quackgrass, things like that, you've got a wider leaf, you've got a bigger stem. This is closer to a weed. It's a lower level plant than this. So if the, if the environment changes, you'll get this. If it, if it changes for the bad, you'll get this, and then you'll get weeds. The sharper, the pricklier, the nastier a weed is, it grows naturally, the more out of balance that soil is. So if you have nine, ten foot musk thistles or uh, cockleburs, Canada thistle, that soil has a ways to go. When you see dandelions showing up, let's see if we can find a couple dandelions. Because, and the reason, the reason we're talking about this uh, Joe is uh, every plant will tell a story and the color the size the shape the posture of the plant will tell you is it happy is it sad and where are you at in your 
restructuring of the soil. Well, as you look down through here, you can see where the sprinklers are hitting. Look at the grass grow there, 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 and down the row. Do you think they liked it? <laughs> where is our dandelion here? Well, okay, but wait a second, John. Is that sprinkler, Where is this? It's 25 feet. So, but it comes out in kind of like a teardrop shape. If okay. You will. Okay. But for some reason, we've got them here and then there, and you can kind of see where they've been concentrating. We're still not there. We've got a little bit, little bit to go. But then you start seeing this kind of stuff, the real fine grasses. Yeah. Starting to pop in there. And this, did I, you plant this grass? No. Do you normally get grass like this this time of the year? No. Well, and you can even see it here too. Yeah. So I think that sprinkler's got like a circle that'll be there. One would be here. One would be there. And that's, what's surprising is we're starting to even see it out there. A spot the sprinkler may not hit as much. Okay. Now, if you were to do the penetrometer right here versus where that grass is, See, right there, we're at 300, so we've got okay. that much. And here we've got that much. Mother, so, Mother Nature. Mm -hmm, responding to what we're... Okay. All of these companies for so many years have said, ah, I don't know about cover crops. Whenever well, everybody's all, rah, 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 get the cover crops going, you know, Wait, just just for giggles, let's go on this side of that patch of grass and see if there's any if it's similar to that or if there's if it's just a fluke. We got to 300 there. Yep. See, and here's another fine area. We got to there. Okay, now did you hear that? Mm -hmm. That's excess magnesium. It's okay. a suction. Yeah. It's there's not enough air in there. It's just like when you're walking through deep mud and. Yeah. So that's a sign that we still got a ways to go. And the, in the last month, we haven't applied because of harvest. Yeah. So. Okay. Now we we're in the first week of November. How do your trees look this year compared to other years? Typically, we'd see a lot of leaf loss or yellowing in the trees trying to go to sleep and get ready for winter, but this year it just hasn't came yet. Seems like they still want to keep growing. Now, is that on everybody's trees? No, it seems like just here. Is this a good thing or a bad thing that your leaves are greener longer? Good thing. Okay. Has time, more time to transfer back and forth, exchange CO2 and oxygen. So you're not sad that you're trees haven't lost their leaves yet? No, not at all. The reason I ask that is the healthier a tree, the longer it'll hold its leaves in the fall, and the harder the wood, the longer it will hold its leaves when you start getting into fall. Yeah. Do we want to look? I don't see any dandelions. I don't either. We still have some morning glory here, but it's, it's not as thick as it once was. Are these early stages of dandelion? No, huh? This is something else. It's something else. Okay, now. Oh, here we go. Well, here's something. Bull thistle? Yeah, I believe so. If, if you, if you, I cut the root most agronomists will look at that root and say, look at that big, almost white tap root. That weed loves calcium. Doesn't really love calcium, but what it's doing, it's going down and grabbing calcium and bringing it back up. This, this root will start off as, as a, just a thread. And this weed, this is, this is probably a really tight area, probably a little pocket gopher. That's the other thing. Pocket gophers do not like what we do to the soil. 
in northeastern Nebraska, a rumor got out that said, yeah, that soil works calcium kills pocket gophers. Mm -hmm. And I was in a convenience store and, and the bunch of the cronies were gathered around. It's like, how's that calcium kill those pocket gophers, Glenn? It's like, you ding-dongs, it doesn't kill them. It just relaxes the soil so the runs collapse. So what you'll see is as the ground gets structured, this is a tough spot, and it's no surprise that there's probably a pocket gopher right here. But this weed is bringing calcium up so when, it, when, this, when this weed dies, it'll distribute that calcium. And you'll have a pocket of calcium right here. And if you forget where this weed is, you're start, going to start seeing some thin grass, some of that fine stem grass coming in around here, yeah. taking advantage of this calcium. Now, when you see purple on a weed, purple always relates to phosphorus. If purple is showing up in the veins of a weed, there is more phosphorus available than what it really appreciates. Not enough to, to diminish its growth, but it's showing signs of stress. And what you see is if you, if you look at this stem right here, that's the most purple vein in the weed. Look at the, look at the posture. It's almost like it's got rheumatoid arthritis. You look at some of these other ones that don't have any purple, and they're, and they're longer, and what they're doing is they're all make, being a little rain gutter, so any moisture that hits anywhere funnels it down for itself. So as this purple gets more prominent throughout there, this weed will eventually go away. When you look at a soil test, the soil test will show you phosphorus as total P, P1, or P2. The phosphorus has to be in P2O5 form to get to the plant. So when there's enough air, enough oxygen, the phosphorus becomes available. And that's why once we, as we open up the soil, phosphorus needs air to be available. Phosphorus, we consider the father of all minerals. So now you got calcium and phosphorus, mom and dad, working together they're gonna start eliminating weeds. Weeds will get eliminated before insects. Weeds at about 10 bricks of sugar in, in, in most plants, these weeds will be gone. Did you, you said something about the morning glory was starting to... Uh... Well, you can see places in it where it's starting to turn yellow, but now we're getting into fall and so cool season they'll start popping yeah. back yeah yeah but it seemed like where the sprinklers concentrated it was making the morning glory sick yep. now the whiter a root is the higher the calcium content is so let me see if i can uh... not cut your finger off mm -hmm. ah Okay, now you see any taproot is made up of tubules or straws. So you see these little circles of white showing up? Yeah. That's calcium that is coming from deeper in those tubules coming up, and that's what forms the root. That, so anytime you look at a, a root, the whiter it is, the healthier it is on a food crop. As this root gets whiter, this thistle will die. In other words, the calcium will get high enough. Weeds do not like available calcium and phosphorus. Disease does not like available calcium and phosphorus. Plant feeding insects do not like available calcium and phosphorus. And compaction does not like available calcium. Yeah. This is why we talk about calcium and phosphorus. Have you ever heard anybody talk like this before, Joe? I have not. <laughs> Only John. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I should apologize to you. <laughs> I've been talking to people, uh, Joe, about it some and just how uh, different of a mindset it is and to get it, get used to thinking at things in a different way than we have in the past. Well, it's, and we've been talking for a little over a year. 
And I don't think John would have given me the time of day if he hadn't seen what we had done on some pretty tough ground to start with. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, yeah. When I went down to Frank's, I was thoroughly impressed. I mean, it, it was not what you'd call great soil to start with, but it's no. turned around considerably. And I have probe envy of Frank. I want my probe to go all the way down before 200 pounds. <laughs> but it takes. Well, and, and Frank will be the first one to admit, he goes, none of the ground that I bought was beautiful when I bought it. Yeah. I bought it because it was lesser priced. I, and I knew I had to dump some money into it. So he says, none of this ground came out of the Garden of Eden in pristine shape. Yeah. Well, and if we were per se at the river where it's sandy loam that, uh, that's the best soil you can get and i mean we're uh growing walnuts out here on ground that in the 80s they told us wouldn't grow walnuts because it wasn't good enough and uh they seem to be growing uh <laughs> you sure it's just not a fluke <laughs> <laughs> yes you and your dad have been growing walnuts for a couple years now? Yeah, I think uh, my dad planted the first orchard in 82 or 83, so. So you're saying your family doesn't necessarily believe everything you're told? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. And uh, when we originally started planting, we had the trees super tight because we didn't think they were going to get very big and did a lot of stuff different because we were worried about the water table affecting them because we have a high water table here and all that stuff and since then we've spaced out to more conventional spacing and mm -hmm. and stuff like that because we found they seem to grow just fine <laughs> can i throw a twist back at you with you said that the river soil is a sandy loam yeah and and you said that that's the best soil yeah and that's what most people say is the best soil yeah i agree that's fantastic soil but everywhere we go people say, what's the favorite soil you want to work on? And they will realize I am from South Dakota. I'll say, I want high mag, tight, compacted soil. And they're like, why? <laughs> I said, it's, it's been tight for years. You, your dad, your granddad, a previous owner has thrown a lot of inputs at that. And this dirty, rotten magnesium, the spoiled child, is like, oh, more nitrogen, more of this, more of that. It's like, I'm not sharing. Yeah. You open that up and get mom back in charge of the house and the soil. She's like, come here, magnesium. You need to just relax. So she puts the squeeze on magnesium, out pops the nitrogen. Oh, you just got to use somebody else's nitrogen or nitrogen you bought 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Becomes available. Yeah. And the thing that most companies won't talk about is when they're looking at the field, if, if you were to ask a professor or a, um, a, a fertilizer rep or an agronomist, what's the most important thing for these trees? They'd probably say nitrogen. Yeah. I've been on those tours when they say nitrogen, of course, I raise my hand in the back. It's like, what about air? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, but that's a good one. That's just, it's a constant. And it's like, really? <laughs> yeah. How is it penetrating? I said, if the, if the microbes in the soil are supposed to be aerobic, they need air. Yeah. And if air can't get into them, they want oxygen. How are we going to get free nitrogen and how are we going to get free oxygen if the air can't get into the soil? And then the, the conductor of the tour is like, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> soil has a, all has a personality. And th this is something, Joe, to look at is now if you look at the other trees, you don't see these cracks. What these cracks are, these cracks are the expression of electricity. This soil is, is electrically pulling this way. This soil is electrically pulling that way. The wider, the deeper, and the more pronounced a crack is, the more out of, the more out of balance that soil is. Higher magnesium on the surface. Yes. Yes. 
Now, in, in Minnesota, in the Red River Valley, which is the, the pride of eastern North Dakota and Minnesota, we had a field a year ago last fall that had cracks that you could throw a pipe wrench down. And this guy, and it was in alfalfa, been in alfalfa for three years. And he, he goes up to this crack and he sticks his arm down up to his bicep. And he's got a pretty good, pretty good gun on him. He says, okay, tough guy, you fix that? It's like, yes. He goes, really? He says, he works for another, another farmer and he's always wanted to beat his boss in corn yield. His boss has used manure in the past. The farmer on this field has never had any manure. So he says, what do we do? He says, I want to mow board plow it. Oh, this is old school. He's organic. So we, we put down three quarters of a pound of calcium with some sugar and some soft rock and some fish and some microbes, plowed it down and did another three quarter. We repeated the process. He has, he's going to beat his boss on corn yield this year. Awesome. But he says, uh, he says, well, there's still cracks out in that field. Well, the cracks went from wider than this to looking like this. I was like, well, of course there's still cracks out there. It's just the first disciplinary action we've given it. Yeah. yeah. So now he really, now, now in his eyes, he's like, oh, we're going to have to spank this soil pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? yes. So he, he's getting his own vocabulary now. And up here we have a real issue with, with what's known as hard pan. We'll get this soil that's super high in magnesium. And we had a, a bunch of these clods that you couldn't break with a hammer. And now they're getting to where just after a couple years, they break nice and easy. And uh, A couple years? How long have you been doing our calcium? One year. After one year. Not a couple. After one year. Edit. Jeez, we got <laughs> get nothing free around here. <laughs> <laughs> got to fight for every inch <laughs> but it's amazing to see this stuff just break down and and melt like that i mean when we first planted the orchard i had to send a hand crew through and break clods of those this big with a hammer so that we could manage them because they were just such big clods the discs were jumping over them and we had a lot of trouble with it whoa whoa whoa, whoa. in this field yes you had a hand crew breaking hard pan with a hammer. We're talking like prison chain gang. I <laughs> know, uh, just employees. <laughs> <laughs> Literally busting them with a hammer. Oh, they were huge. Yeah, they. Oh, we, you remember? Oh yeah, I worked for him. Right? He was one of them. We planted that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a real story. Oh yeah. Okay. No, they, they were big out here. Yeah. Not that we're down to stories, but he's a great storyteller. <laughs> Uh, yeah, remember when we planted this thing, yeah. we had brought up some chunks that were just so big we couldn't do anything with them, you know, we were just moving them out of the way when we were disking and the disc was jumping over them and then like we, concrete yeah. yeah, so to see it like that is impressive. Yeah, in one year. Well, now here's the thing with this, this piece of soil, as you look at a field or an orchard or whatever you're looking at, this soil all has different personalities. This is going to be tougher soil. If we look at the leaves, many times there may be a lack of air. This, this tree may not produce as good as some of the other trees that don't have these cracks. Yeah. This is going to be more airless and you'll see it. And a lot of people say, well, how do you know that? It's like, okay, if we shut off half your air or three fourths of your air, you can still breathe, but not very much. How much work are you going to get done? And they usually look at me and like, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. So it's all about air. Yeah. If, if we can air, get air down here and get the bugs alive. Yeah. And, and so these different carbon sequestration groups and the carbon networks and the people that are wanting to reduce the 415 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, they need to realize that that air with carbon in it has to get pushed into the soil so the microbes can, can utilize it and then make it utilizable for the plant. Hi. Does it only get pushed during high pressure systems? 
or does the air can the air enter during low pressure as well? Ah, good question. I I apologize. I didn't I didn't completely answer that. During a high pressure front, that air is heavy and sinking, and and that's what is the inhalation of the soil is the high pressure front. When and normally a high pressure front many times will um, precede a rain event. Right. Many times after that, you'll get a low pressure front, which is light rising air, and after that rain, that's the exhalation. Gotcha. Here's the other thing that all these people are talking about, no-till, 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 and then when they get into talking about no-till, they'll talk a little bit more about no-till. Yeah. It isn't all it's cracked up to be, and, and here's why I say that. These leaves are supposed to be 47% carbon. And if, if any carbon residue or, uh, or fodder is left on top of the ground, it's molecularly lighter than air. So when the sun hits it, it'll go up, up, and away. You burn a tire, the black smoke, yeah, that's carbon. You lose it. When you take this leaf and feed it to microbes under the ground, they will chew up the carbon, they'll chew up the oxygen, they'll get the calcium and the phosphorus, and that carbon, when it's hooked to two oxygen, which makes CO2, carbon dioxide, that carbon now becomes one and a half times heavier than air. It won't leave you. I, th I believe the reason that so many people are talking about no-till is because chemical companies and fertilizer companies profit more from no-till. So you think about where your grass is just naturally growing, let's just call that a volunteer cover crop. You have twice the aerobic zone where the grass is thick and lush than a foot on either side. Well, that's no good for the fertilizer company. Yeah. It's good for you. Yeah. It's, it's good for your neighbors that are growers. You know, so a living plant will help heal the soil if given a chance. So now these no-tiller, the people that are pushing no-till are saying, well, whether you uh, terminate it with a chemical or just crimp it to, to eliminate it, if that can be lightly worked in, and I get it with, with an orchard, you, you want a nice solid floor. In this case, just having the roots is, is a benefit. Yeah, yeah. You know, and what you're seeing is the finer grass is starting to come in as that soil softens up. So that's the first thing that you won't have to spend the money on a broadleaf herbicide. Yeah. So looking back at this ground, with the cracks as they are, this will take longer to soften up and heal and see the benefits. But you know, look, you, you still got monster leaves. Yeah. Now the other thing to look at. Yeah. When you look at the leaves here, you know. Tell me, have you? Do you ever see these? And granted, these are younger leaves. Normally, that first leaf out is bigger, and you'll get smaller leaves behind it. Yeah. That's the energy. That's this is carbon and oxygen. When you have more carbon and oxygen here you're going to get subsequent bigger leaves behind your first flag leaf or lead leaf. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be something to watch. So yeah. the first leaf is always is usually biggest. Yeah. You know, granted they're younger, but as as these mature, you can get all of your leaves that size. Almost as big as my face. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Yeah. You know, now looking up, here's the other thing. As you look up, look at the ratio of leaf size. Gravity plays a part in this. It takes energy to push minerals in the gravitational field of the Earth. The more air this soil gets, the more microbes that are producing a half a volt, electricity is a form of energy, 
to push up. So many times you'll see big leaves on the bottom here, not as hard to push, but the top leaves many times fruit and leaves are smaller. Yeah. And that all comes down to what you have up here is all representative of what you have down here. Yeah. I mean, but that's that's a cool big leaf, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And see, this is something we also battle here, which is known as crown gall. So I'm hoping once we get the soil fixed and some of the microbes going, we can start to uh, heal some of these sick trees. Okay, crown gall. Can, which... What's your definition? What's your thoughts on crown gall? It's a fungus that attacks the tree, and sometimes it'll kill it, and sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll just make it sick. Uh, we had a extremely wet spring this year, so mm -hmm. crown gall went crazy this year, mm -hmm. and uh, this stuff just exploded. But so, so crown crown gall? Yeah. G U L L. Yep. So you're saying it is a detrimental, pathogenic, unwanted fungus? Yes. Okay. Can we talk about this for a second? We've yeah. never talked about this much. No. Detrimental, pathogenic, fungus, algae, mold is all categorized. They're all in the same scumbag family. Anytime you look at a detrimental fungus, algae, or mold, it likes a certain environment. If you ask the experts, they'll say, whatever the fungus may be, rust, mold, crown gall, they'll say, well, it's just, it likes a warm, wet, wet environment. Yeah. And they're right. They're absolutely right, but there's more. This fungus enjoys a negatively charged, low sugar environment. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that a different way. Negatively charged is a calcium deficient environment because calcium carries a double positive charge. Low sugar, sugar being made up of carbon and oxygen, low photosynthesis, low carbon oxygen in the soil, possibly low calcium and phosphorus in the tree. These big cracks, there's more magnesium or another way to look at it, there's a deficiency of calcium. Yeah. So, is it coincidence that that this fungus is here where the cracks right. are? Is that coincidence? No. We've never talked about this before, have no, we? No, we haven't. This is a huge problem up here. Yeah. Huge. Huge problem. Well, and this is the thing to look at. So, fungus, algae, and mold enjoys a warm, wet, low calcium low sugar environment, pond scum. What's the fix? You need a positive environment. You need a positive charge of calcium. Calcium brings a positive charge. Calcium and phosphorus makes photosynthesis, which, which allow the microbes to produce carbon dioxide. Fungus doesn't like carbon and oxygen, and they do not like calcium and phosphorus. Is there a natural fix for this that you won't have to worry about it? Yes. Healthy soil, healthy tree, this crap will go away. I would be very happy with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Joe, help me out here. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm literally asking, as we've walked down here, we haven't seen many leaves on the ground, and, and, and John has no. said the leaves are staying tighter on the trees. Right. We see this tree with, with, this tree with crown gull, deep cracks, low air and a lot greener the drops a lot so and there's a lot more Drop leaves it. and they don't have the color right is that just coincidence no it's less healthy it's not holding on as long yeah yeah so now you look at that tree over there you got some you can see some cracks mm -hmm. you can see more leaves look at the next tree not as many cracks mm -hmm. Virtually no leaves. Mm -hmm. you, are you sure that isn't just coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff we look at. And I've had guys come up to me and they're like, 
you're from South Dakota and you it's like you don't grow walnut trees in South Dakota. Okay. You don't grow citrus trees. You shouldn't know anything about this. It's like, and then he looks at his guys and they'll say, why did I have to have a guy from South Dakota come out here and teach me about California agronomy? And it gets real quiet. It's like, because here again, this tree, look at the cracks, mm -hmm. look at the leaves. Now we're, and I think John had said, we're kind of on the bottom end of this field. Yes. And this is a little bit tougher. So if you look, if you look down, you'll see the leaves. There's a higher concentration of leaves earlier mm -hmm. than looking back that way. Oh, that's just cool. But, and, and see, this is the fun thing is I'm not here all day, every day. Right. You guys are in these, in these orchards looking and doing, and you're looking at 20 other things. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, a different set of eyes comes in. They're like, and after I leave, you guys will talk, and John will say, what do you think? Is he completely crazy? <laughs> and you being honest say, well, not completely. <laughs> uh, with your leaf, okay. when you do start doing this and building up the soil, do you, will you see a difference in your pressure balm yeah. readings? Yeah. Yes. And will you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the guys that are pressure bombing that we've worked with south of here, here's a cool thing. Carbon. When you get a higher level of carbon and oxygen in the leaf, when you get more carbon and oxygen in the soil, Carbon will hold four times its weight in water. Okay. You know what that means. Frank, who has been John's mentor, um, we were just down there and they're like, yeah, most of our trees, we didn't irrigate in July. And, said, and we said, the whole month? It's like, no, everybody else was irrigating. We pressure bombed. We were they good. Yeah. They've been at it a while, though. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's one thing is down the line, you know, what we, what we did at Frank's, we will do right here. Right. We will do in this area. But when you're talking generations of farming, you know, a decade or two decades to repair the soil for hundreds of years, isn't that bad of a deal? <laughs> no, no, no. And the thing of it is with the program, we can make significant differences in a season or two. You know, and the bad thing about farming is in crops like this, you got one shot each year. Yeah. And if it doesn't work that one time, you're screwed for the year. So a lot of farmers are like, eh, I'm not sure what to do about this. We were just talking, when we, when we look at the cracks, we see more leaves on the ground. This is more of the bottom end of the field. Correct. You look you look down the row, you see the leaves. Oh, wow. <laughs> I never noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I, Wait a minute, I, I got to get this on tape. <laughs> I have to introduce him to his neighbors and I have to show him what's going on on the floor of his orchard. <laughs> <laughs> This You're welcome. Video evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really noticed that. I hadn't, you know, looked at it, and sometimes it just needs a different eye in order to see some of this stuff. See, and, and that's, uh, Joe and I, when you were on the phone, that's what Joe and I were talking about. I said, you guys are out here, and you're looking at, at 50 different things. I'm not here like you guys are, and I can come in and say, well, look at this, look at this, and, and they're like, you know, he ain't much to look at, but he may be worth having around every now and then. <laughs> and a lot of times we get so into the day-to-day -day and you look at it all the time, you never step back and get a fresh look at it like you uh, like you get to do because you only come out here. But also every when so we're often. doing the same thing over and over, you kind of don't look at it as hard because you are done it, we've seen it, we know what's supposed to happen. You're taught and told to look at other things. Right. So just at the cracks, the leaves. So this ground, the deeper the crack, the more calcium it's gonna to take to fix that because it's a bigger problem. So if you did a soil probe here and a soil probe on that end, you may have five, 10, 15% difference in magnesium. Yeah. So what's, what's gonna happen is this orchard and all orchards, all fields will not heal evenly. Mm -hmm. They will not improve evenly. Your better end is going to improve quicker unless there's a 
designated line, it's like, okay, from here on, it's crap. Can you, can you hammer that harder? It's tough. Yeah, yeah. You really have to start getting down and micromanaging. And in most cases, there isn't time and money for that. Yeah. So two pounds of calcium may be a little strong down there. Maybe a little weak. weak down there. Yeah. 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 So you look for the happy medium. Yeah. And we have trouble here during the winter. We don't like to see the water ever set on it for more than 12, 24 hours after a big rain event. And so I was contemplating even adding more calcium on the lower end to try to help that water filtrate out faster so it doesn't sit as long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we had record rainfall last year, 30 something inches where we normally get 24. And uh, there was definitely some water sitting on that end of the orchard. Micromoles or millisiemens is, is a decimal point. And this is a reader between these two metal pieces. And when you stick it in the soil, or if you squeeze it hard enough, I have no electricity in my body. But it's also a temperature oh. thermometer as mm -hmm. well. So when you stick this in the soil, what we're looking for is a homogenized electricity. And if I can explain that, it's kind of like when you walk into a professional stadium and you go down on the field and you go up in the far seat and the temperature's all the same. Like, how do they do that? In the soil, if you have microbes that are naturally active, they are the moderators of the electricity and the producers of the electricity. So if we were to come over here and probe this in the soil, we would want to see a nice consistent number. And so a lot of guys will just come over and they'll stick it in and take one reading. Well, that's one, one reading in, at one spot. So we want to stick it in until we get a reading. And then we just want to slowly push it in. And the more consistent this number is, the healthier that soil is. So that one went from point 0.1 to point 0.5, and so it's not really all that consistent there. No. Now, you brought up a good point, John. As I was, you guys grab this and push it in. You've already done this. We've talked about this, but, Joe, when you push it in. Ladybird, come here. <laughs> <laughs> Camera whore. When you. <laughs> <laughs> When you push it in, you, when you see the number jump, you'll feel it's getting harder to push right now. And what happens, what that means is anaerobic soil hasn't given the energy to the microbes in the tree. So if, if you want to just take this and just, and you can do it anywhere, but as you watch the numbers, feel how much pressure you're pushing down on it. When the numbers jump, you'll feel the pressure has increased as well. So what that means is there's more energy that the plant can utilize once air is introduced to it. Number dropped when it got easy, huh, yeah, Joe? Did. <laughs> did you see that? Yeah, it did. See, that, and that Mother Nature is so cool. So when you, when you felt it, now two things, there, there could have been less pressure on that tip, but there's also less stress in less pressure in the that that energy well. has been utilized. There's a root that has gone into it. A little stiff right there, Joe? And it threw up a higher number, huh? Yeah. Now, now if your feet come off the ground, that probe is probably gonna break. <laughs> <laughs> This is basically the heartbeat if it, or the electricity. If it's a low electricity, it's like a low battery. If it's too much electricity, you start blowing stuff up. The microbes will monitor and, and carry that electricity right where the plant wants it because they work together. This is part of Mother, mother Nature. It's part of Mother Earth. It's been doing this for quite a few years. <laughs> And so that's the heartbeat, that's the, that's the respiration, and then when we squeeze the leaf and check the sugar, 
that's the fuel tank. So just like a small gas motor, you got to have fuel, you got to have spark, and you got to have air. Yep. Same no thing different. Here. Yeah. No different. And nobody gets to sell you air. And the more air you get, the more free nitrogen you get. This is why a lot of the big companies don't appreciate what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So if you talk to your PC or talk to your agronomist, you may hear, oh, that guy from South Dakota's out here again. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. He's goofy. He's got to travel this far because all of his neighbors think he's crazy. <laughs> well, and they're right about that. <laughs> now, here's the other thing. In, in harder ground, you're going to see worm activity before you see microbial activity. And all, many of these companies will say, oh, you got worms, that's beautiful, that's what you want. The top portion of the soil is like the digester of the soil, it's like the stomach. We don't want worms in our stomach. We spend money, you spend money to deworm your dogs. Yeah. Now, the worms are good, but the only reason the worms are here is because this environment is too difficult, too tight, too tough for microbes. So the earthworms, night crawlers, these good worms want to have an, they need an aerobic environment, but they will create the environment so then the microbes can come in because they're breaking up tougher compounds that the microbes can't. And as soon as they get that broken up, they'll move down and start preconditioning the soil so the microbes can follow them. So worms are a good sign, but it's still primitive soil. Microbes are the most efficient digesters. And this is digesters. what you're talking about, worm activity here, these holes. Yep. Yep. And you'll actually start seeing worm casings here. <laughs> right around here. We, we saw a lot of these down south. These, these little particles here are usually worm casings okay. that are coming up. And you'll, you'll see how soil will kind of have little bubbled up. Those are the worm casings that'll be, and usually as soon as you start getting some rain, you're gonna start seeing more of those. Yeah, I did notice that this winter. And, and, and as those increase in, uh, in frequency, then you're getting closer for the microbes to take over. And the microbes, that's what you really want. But these big companies with fertilizer and chemicals don't want you to be there because now you got healthy soil and healthy soil doesn't need a lot of chemicals and fertilizer. No. Historically, 750 pounds in the fifth year is what you historically harvest. Yep. This was the first year we harvested and I got a thousand pounds off these this year. And you're saying it wasn't the best growing year? No. Do you normally pull a thousand pounds, 250 pounds, 25% more? Do you normally pull that off your first year? I wouldn't think so, no. I haven't. Uh... Well, either yes or no. <laughs> no. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thoroughly happy with the tree, the new growth we got this year. I would, you know, six, six to eight feet, 10 in places. Uh, you know, the sad part about it is we grow these trees nice and big, and then in the winter we cut them back off, and they look small again, and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> well, so now let me get this right. What did you do different? What gave you another 250 pounds here? Has to be the calcium. Nothing else different? Well, sugar, molasses, soft rock. And uh, other than that, I didn't do anything different. I still applied the nitrogen the same, sprayed the same, did everything else the same. So you didn't do a lot of different change-ups on anything? No, that was it. So the year was tougher, you got more foliar, more vegetative growth, and you got another 250 pounds, more, 250 pounds more than what you traditionally expect. Yes. On your first harvest fifth year. Yep, yep. Nice. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs>